Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Insects for Animals, Safely Feeding Their Health. Today's webinar is brought to you by VNU Asia Pacific, Ildex Vietnam, and in association with AFIA, the Association for Insects as Food and Feed in Asia, and FAVA, the Federation of Asian Veterinary Associations. My name is Josh Galt. I'm on the executive committee of AFIA, and I'll be your host and moderator taking you through today's program. We have a great program with a lot of information to get through for the next two hours. After opening addresses from FAVA and AFIA, uh, we will have a range of presentations detailing safety and sustainability with insects and animal feed, health and nutrition, BSF larva for livestock, for aquaculture, the veterinary perspective of insects and animal feed. And then we'll have all of our presenters together for a roundtable panel discussion about insects in pet food. Um, I invite you to ask your questions. If you have questions or comments throughout the duration of this webinar, you can put them in the Q&A box that is on your screen. Uh, if you have a question for a specific presenter, feel free to leave their name with your question so that I can direct that to them. And finally, last but not least, at the very end of our presentation, uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you take 30 seconds, there will be a QR code which you can scan and leave your feedback, what you loved about today's presentation, uh, what you would suggest, recommendations for making it better in the future uh, so that we can make these as informative and beneficial as possible. So I'd like to invite to the screen for the opening address, the president of FAVA, the Federation of Asian Veterinary Associations, Dr. Kaza Nizamuddin bin Hassan Nizam. Dr. Kaza, the screen is yours, welcome. Thank you, Josh, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings to all speakers and participants attending this important webinar entitled Insects for Animals Safely Feeding the Health. I'm indeed privileged and thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. This webinar is uh, jointly organized uh, by the Asian Food and Feed Insect Association, AFFIA, the Federation of Asian Veterinary Association, FAWA, and brought to you by VNU Asia Pacific Exhibition Services and ILDEX. Vietnam. FAWA is a 25 member association comprising of 21 member countries in the Asia Oceania region with three associate and one affiliate members. FAWA has got an outreach of about 100,000 veterinarians. FAWA plays an important role in working with national veterinary organizations to carry out programs, projects, and activities to benefit member associations. FAWA, in collaboration with VNU Asia Pacific Exhibition Services, have successfully organized so far three webinars, which were on the impact of COVID-19 on livestock production, on rabies and its control measures in different countries, and in collaboration with FAO on antimicrobial resistance awareness webinar in five countries, with a competition to design small-scale poultry houses to meet biosecurity measures. Today's webinar will take a different perspective and focus on feeding insects to animals. I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting webinar. Insects, as you know, uh, can be a source of feed to animals and have shown to have many benefits. Currently, it is already playing a significant role in the livestock industry and expected to further expand into the future. Insect feeding is considered as natural upcyclers which is the creative use of useless products and turning them into useful products. It sits well with our concerns to planet Earth in adopting a circular economy. Insects can feed on food waste, compost, slurry, and then transform it into good quality protein, which can then be fed to animals. Insects has, have a high feed conversion efficiency it also uses significantly less water, it's less land dependent, as well as there's reduced greenhouse emission. All of these are important consideration as it in, its impact on climatic changes is very much smaller compared to the conventional feeding strategies, which are currently practiced. 
Hence, it may be a better option. It is a better option to be adopted on livestock in livestock production. Insect rearing can be introduced in the rural ec economy, as was being done in Kenya, with the intention of improving their people's livelihood. Hence, governments, especially in developing countries, can encourage insect rearing as another additional activity to increase their income. Challenges remain to be addressed, some of which are to identify and promote the use of local insect species and local waste streams. The need to use renewable energy for insect rearing must be further explored. It's also important to establish proper waste management systems to supply the right substrate for the insects. Mass production technologies of insects through mechanization, automation, and processing should be pursued to eventually reduce the cost of production. Improving rearing methods will result in the reduction of water usage. Often, we mention that insect production has less environmental impact and it is sustainable. However, this needs to be quantified to clearly demonstrate the benefits. Health risk using animal and human waste must be clearly identified and mitigated. This, in turn, will be important to manage consumer acceptance. A comprehensive legal framework must be in place to allow this industry to further grow, which includes legislation, standardization, and facilitation. There's also a need to explore possibilities of public-private partnership. The benefits of rearing insects as additional livelihood strategy, especially in the rural economy, should be well articulated and explained. I hope the papers presented by excellent speakers during this webinar will give further insights, ideas, and inputs to the audience to be involved in insect rearing and the use of insects as feed for animals. Once again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank AFFIA up here and its members, the speakers, and VNU Asia Pacific Exhibition Services for a successful webinar. Thank you to all participants who have logged in, and I sincerely hope you will gain from today's event. Wish you all the best. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Kazan. I appreciate that overview of insects and from the FAVA perspective. Uh, next up, the, the perspective of APIA, the Asian Food and Feed Insect Association, from one of the co-founders, who is also a consultant in the region for insect companies, Mr. Nathan Pretzasai. Nathan, screen's yours. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Kaza. This is a great pleasure for AFIA to uh, organize, co-organize this, this webinar with you, also with VNU. And uh, we look forward to engage further in the, in the future as well uh, on the topic of insect as food and feed. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, I believe you can see it now. So to um, present, now I will drive you through a quick presentation of the Asian Food and Feed Insect Association. Uh, as a consultant based in Thailand and as an AFIA executive committee member, I have been working on, on this topic for the last five years in, in the region. So uh, about AFIA, we basically aim at bringing um, industry research stakeholders, industry and research stakeholders, sorry, from the insect sector in a collaborative movement towards the development of entomoculture, entomophagy and their related activities. So we have several pillars that drive our activities in the region. Um, the first one being on the market access at local, regional, and international levels. We are also on the promotion of insect as food and feed with the organization of several events. It was a little bit limited as you understand last year, but we aim at keeping on, on, on organizing such events. Um, we work on the regulatory clarification as well for insect as food or feed applications. We also aim at being a platform for all of our members uh, on the topic of insect as food and feed to address specific challenges, organizing it in subgroups, depending on topics. And uh, we also uh, define shared position uh, regarding specific transversal issues, such as, for example, animal welfare. We will get back to this point later on. 
And we also work with um, other international associations such as the IPAA, which is for Australia, IPIF for Europe, and NASIA for uh, America. So we definitely welcome you and invite you to join us uh, to support and lead the Asian insect industry. So this is how it started back, 2000, uh, back in 2016, in August exactly, with a meeting of uh, companies and researchers uh, motivated by this insect as food and feed industry. And uh, last year was our most successful events in collaboration with Cassette South University for two days on research and markets of the insect as food and feed sector. So here are uh, our members. Um, we are all around ASEAN and a bit beyond as well, including Japan, India, Australia. Um, this information can be made available, available after the, the webinar, but you can see that we have a diversity of profiles of uh, locations and activities in our association. We also count among our members, three honorary members based in Thailand. So that's it for the AFIA introduction, and I'll give back the microphone to uh, Josh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. And for anyone who is interested uh, in learning more about AFIA, you can go to AFFIA.org uh, and get more information about the association. Uh, so let's get into a little bit more detail now about insects for animal feed. Uh, next up on, on our program, a presentation on safety for sustainability by Mr. Leo Wynn, the founder and CEO of Protinga. They are a company in Malaysia. They are an AFIA member. And Leo is going to present on a topic which is very important to the industry, safety for sustainability. Leo, take it away. Thank you very much, Josh. Let's see. The right screen. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you very much, Josh, and um, the organizers for the webinar. My name is Leo. I'm the CEO and founder of Pratenga. We are a Singapore and um, Malaysia-based insect technology company um, working with the Black Soldier Fly to develop um, bioconversion and farming systems to recycle nutrients. And what I would like to share with you today is um, the aspects of safety. Um, around insect products that we believe, um, and that's a shared belief among AFIA members, is a prerequisite for sustainability. No, no sustainability without safety. Um, now, as an introduction um, to, um, to sustainability, sustainability and, and, and safety, um, first the question, you know, why, why insects and why sustainable at all? Um, there are three major factors for um, uh, why insects? One is global food security crisis, um, where simply more nutrients are needed than we currently have. We need alternative sources. And that's particularly the case in uh, protein supply, um, in um, protein supply, particularly around aquaculture production, the feed uh, inputs for aquaculture, but also for poultry, and um, an increase that the current um, the basis, the current uh, commodity sources of protein um, can't uh, scale um, according with the demand. The third one is the impact that our food system overall has on, on the planet, on the environment, um, with 37% of greenhouse gases overall being emitted by agriculture and by the food system. Uh, with that being expected to increase to 50% uh, to by, by 2050. Um, contributing to that is that the, the pillars of our food system, um, in, in particular the animal proteins we use, uh, like fish meal, um, are uh, depleting the ocean of their resources. Um, but from an Asian perspective, uh, also have, have a consideration on, on food security with heavy dependence on imported protein ingredients, uh, particularly around soybean um, that's imported and heavily dependent on the Americas. So insects are a efficient, a natural and a circular source that can be produced um, locally and regionally. The black soldier fly in particular, which we are focusing on in this webinar, um, thrives in, in high density. It's ideally suited for 
um, the uh, for, for mass production for cultivation also due to its fast development cycles to its uh, versatility in the diet um, and because it's neither a pest nor a vector um, so it has very low um, bio risk it's also sustainable um, and you know that that's not a given this has been actually evaluated um, in, in multiple studies two of which I'm, I'm highlighting here um, it's not just a ingredient, it is one that has a proven track record of um, a, a low environmental um, impact, uh, including at um, pilot scale that the industry is in um, across the globe at the moment. Now, it's sustainable, but is it safe? As I said in the beginning, it doesn't really matter if it's sustainable, if it's not safe. It's safety is a prerequisite. Um, and the good news is, Insects are safe, um, insect products are safe. And um, in, in the next couple of minutes, I want to share with you some of the aspects that, that make it safe and also kind of put it in, in line with uh, other ingredients. Um, it is a novel ingredient, but at the same time, it is a um, animal protein ingredient. Uh, it's an animal oil ingredient. And that category of product uh, exist and has a long um, track record in um, the market. It's a regulated product category um, across the world with safety standards and the safety standards that apply for fish meal, for example, the safety standards that apply for poultry meals and meat and bone meals and others are essentially the same that insect products have to adhere to to ensure its safety. Um, and so the um, it's, it's really a number of safety aspects across the whole value chain um, that make insects a safe ingredient. Um, and that is the same really, you know, you, if you think about a fish, is a fish edible or not? Well, it depends, right? It, it might have been uh, grown well and, and farmed well and harvested well, but if it lies with a fishmonger for two days in the sun and he still sells it, it's probably not safe anymore. So everything that comes um, before that in the value chain doesn't matter if in the distribution, for example, um, uh, something is wrong. And that is really the same for any food product, whether it's uh, fruits and vegetables, whether it's meats, whether it's uh, animal proteins. Um, what I want to uh, illustrate here is the, the solid foundation that the insect industry has already built across these four main pillars um, that, that make up the safety aspects from the feed input to um, the farming of the insect to the processing um, and to then finally the distribution and the, the aspects that, that make it relevant. So on feed input, it's a traceability question. It's a question around contamination. So do we include, um, how do we uh, mitigate risk of pathogens, of mycotoxins, of heavy metals, or foreign matters coming in at the farm site? What are the hygiene practices um, adhered to? Um, animal welfare does play a role in the safety of the product as well, because uh, it, it is a factor for, um, for disease development. Um, quality control standards established um, and, and general farming standards with good agricultural practices, for example, that, um, that can be applied and should be applied to, to the farm level. At the processing stage, um, this is very important, the, the product sterilization. Um, what are the standards around that? So, as in, in most agriculture, whether it's plant or, um, or, or animal um, agriculture, the, um, the, the primary production of the materials is usually less um, regulated. The critical point um, is in the processing, right? where um, whether you look at rendered products, the fish meal or, or poultry meal, the, the, the real kind of critical points are in, in the processing and the sterilization, um, that's also where, um, uh, where, where pathogen microbial um, uh, factors um, need to be eliminated from the product. And then the proper packaging, storage, logistics, the traceability of the product. Um, and um, an important factor, uh, the authenticity of the product. So uh, adulteration, which is a big um, issue uh, in, in the food system overall. So when it comes to the product safety, um, there are a couple of 
core risk categories that, that have been identified um, in, in various risk assessments, including GMP plus risk assessment for insect processing um, that include mycotoxin, um, which have been found to not accumulate in the uh, soldier fly, the microbiology, uh, which the soldier fly larvae reduces in the feed substrate. But again, the critical point is actually then in the processing rather than in the feedstocks um, or the, the farming. The heavy metals, which are um, uh, an important point to be evaluated, measured, and controlled at the input of the farm. Um, they, most of them don't actively bioaccumulate in the larvae. Cadmium does. Um, but in general, if you have too much input, um, you will carry that through as with any, um, uh, with any um, farming activity, whether it's in your soil with the vegetables or in, in your chicken. Um, the good thing about the, the insect uh, protein in this case is that um, it is using, in, in most cases, residues and byproducts from the food industry, um, meaning that the heavy metal checks are in practice um, should be upstream of where insect production comes into play. Um, pesticide residues, problem in, in plant um, ingredients is uh, luckily not the big problem in insect products that would be noticed at the farm um, because that has a direct impact on the, um, on the insect. And then adulteration and foreign matter that, that really is an important um, consideration. This is one where AFIA really um, uh, comes to play as well. The members of AFIA being um, reputable uh, companies um, that, that strive and, and kind of commit to the same standards of, um, of, of guaranteed production. Like you, you, you get what you buy. Um, now, diving into some of the um, points within that, uh, is at the beginning of the um, of that value chain, the feed substrate management. Um, one of the benefits and one of the uh, unique opportunities of the black soldier fly is the variety of um, input materials that it can consume, um, including uh, of animal origin, plant origin, pre-consumer, post-consumer. These need to be managed. These need to adhere to the local regulatory environment. Um, and th those are different uh, in Europe, in Australia, across Southeast Asian countries, in China and the US. So depending on where the farm is, um, it has to, of course, adhere to the input requirement. Um, and then the uh, risk factors that I identified and illustrated before need to be managed in the substrate and then across the production value chain. Um, on the hygiene side, good hygiene practices um, on the farming of insects have been um, defined as guides um, by organizations like IPIF, the um, AFIA um, counterpart in Europe, for example, but also being actively um, promoted uh, within AFIA and by AFIA. And then um, the well-established food and feed industry quality and safety standards such as GMP plus, HACCP and ISO standards also do apply um, and translate into the insect production. They guide how AFDA members um, build and develop their uh, production systems and SOP and um, certification under these um, uh, schemes is of course also available and applicable for insect farming. Um, those cover the substrate management, the insect rearing, the processing, as well as the storage and the transport of the product to the entire value chain that I outlined just now. Um, and then on uh, processing of the product, this is a, um, an important step as I um, uh, highlighted before, as it is the inactivation, the cooking and the drying um, of, the insect uh, of, of the insect biomass. Um, that is a major control point for, um, uh, for, for microbiological um, risk factors um, in um, by the European Union in their model health certificate. There are seven met methods and, um, and, and and set points and time uh, times and methods on particle size, um, for example, specified um, that uh, insect um, producers should adhere to if they want to comply with European standards. So there are um, standards that have been uh, adapted specifically for the insect industry already in existence. Um, for, um, for our product. Um, and then lastly, as, a, as an example, uh, shelf life, of course, is an important 
part of the safety as well. Um, it's, it's a new product and the, and the body of, of, of knowledge um, on this is, is kind of continuously being shaped, of course, by the companies themselves, but also by independent studies. So here, one that I would like to highlight um, uh, more recently that, that looked at shelf life in tropical climates um, and found the shelf life of seven months given um, uh, strike moisture around 5%, um, uh, uh, clean um, um, storage container and PP or PPE bags, um, often with liners, uh, to, to prevent moisture or humidity ingression um, and um, appropriate storage conditions. So one of the factors here is, of course, the oil content in the product as well, and, um, and then oil rancidity over time, um, particularly in, in the tropical climate. Um, generally, as with all products, um, the fresher the better, um, but uh, yeah, packaging, um, storage, and, and logistics do have a really important impact on the safety as well. Now, um, to, to round it off, um, insects are safe. Um, they can be safe, and they can be so safe um, that they uh, can be used in human food uh, as edible products, um, including the black soldier fly. And um, that's what I would like to round off my uh, little introduction on, on safety for sustainability with, with three examples from the food space. Um, insect uh, protein is actively being um, developed in, in food products as well. Um, here, an example from uh, South Africa, looking at milk replacers um, using insect biomass. Um, another uh, study that's been performed on baked goods in Europe, um, replacing uh, dairy butter with uh, insect butter, insect oil, basically churned insect oil, um, and looking at their taste and, um, and functional property effects um, and, and finding uh, a really good use for it. Um, and lastly, also as a meat replacer in, um, uh, in, in, in conventional meat products like sausages, um, burger patties, and others where, um, where uh, substitution has been demonstrated um, by companies, but also by um, independent third party uh, or academic uh, investigations. So the product and the ingredient itself um, is safe. It can be um, uh, even safe to the, to the standards of the food industry, the human food industry. Um, and uh, like with any food product, uh, safety is not a given. Safety is um, a active um, uh, process and it, it, it always has to be a uh, top priority concern because the sustainability of the product, the sustainability of the whole industry really depends on the safety of, um, of our product. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and pass the word back to Josh. Thanks, Leo. Uh, it's, it's so great to hear that the insect industry adheres to the highest standards in terms of food and feed production. It gives a lot, of, a lot of confidence for those who maybe are not so familiar with insects as feed, and also, as you touched on, for human consumption. Um, that they do adhere to the, the highest standards in terms of production and the whole value chain. But one question that might come up in, in knowing that is why? Why would we want to use insects? Yeah, they're sustainable and okay, they're safe, but what about the actual nutritional benefits? So I'd like to pass it back to Nathan Pratisai from AFIA, who's going to explain a little bit about the health and nutrition of Black Soldier Fly. And his presentation is titled Health and Nutrition of the BSFL. State of art. Nathan? Thank you, Josh, again. Thanks, uh, Leo, also for the very nice presentation. So I'll share my screen once again. Okay. I believe you can all see it from now. So um, I'm going to cover um, an overview as an introduction of the next speakers regarding the animal health and nutritional benefits from the black soldier fly larvae uh, use. So a little reminder, you have seen it already in the previous presentation, but this is the life cycle of the black soldier fly larvae. Of course, um, the time uh, will vary depending on the rearing conditions, but as you can see, it's, it's pretty short overall, uh, a month and a half about. And uh, for, the, for the application of the black soldier fly larvae, most uh, of the application are using um, a stage between the larval stage and the prepupal stage 
usually at the last instar of the larval stage. And this is the uh, main product we are looking at and its derivatives as well. A little also um, reminder or introduction to, to some of you regarding the production um, chain. Usually it starts with the acquisition of the feedstocks that will be then prepared and formulated to match the requirements of the larvae. This larvae will be reared in uh, small containers, different types of boxes or crates before the larvae will be harvested and where uh, also the remainings, what the larvae have digested will be also separated. So this insect manure will become a frass, which can be used as a soil conditioner or soil fertilizer. And the larvae will then be used as a product further processed for its protein, oils, and other products such as chitin, which are of relevance uh, for feed applications and food in some cases, as you just saw. The whole larvae can also be of interest in, in some cases. Okay, so some key elements, um, as uh, Leo and Josh highlighted, uh, safety and sustainability are, are key elements, but nutrition also is a key driver for uh, companies and researchers to look at the black soldier fly larvae. I highlighted here some macro elements. Uh, so the moisture is usually around 70, 75% in the larvae, a crude protein contents that can vary depending on several elements. The fat is also a major element in the larvae, also varying depending on the rearing practices and chitin is also a, an important a part of the product. The key factors that influence this composition will be first on the substrate side, um, then the rearing practices will also influence that, uh, and later on as a final step, the processing practices will also have an influence on the product composition. Okay, so um, it is an interesting protein source. Uh, first of all, the uh, quality of the protein for its amino acid profile is similar to some extent to the fish meal uh, as, as, as a protein source. Methionine and lysine have been reported to be a bit lower in, in a black soldier fly larvae meal compared to fish meal. And in this case, it's a little more similar to soybean meal. Um, insect protein, black soldier fly larvae protein is recognized to be a rich source of arginine which is often lacking in a plant-based protein. And it has variable digestibility levels, um, sometimes because chitin is not extracted from the final product, but also depending on the animals that is targeted. If uh, animals have or not the, the, the enzymes to digest, for example, chitin present in the protein meal. This is also an important fat source with a fatty acid profile uh, similar to coconut oil, uh, in terms of its major elements, saturated fatty acids around 75, monounsaturated fatty acids uh, 15%, and polyunsats around 10%. This is um, the most varying nutrients in the composition of the larvae, uh, as it varies uh, quite significantly depending on the substrate that is used to feed the larvae. Lauric, palmitic, and oleic acids are uh, primary fatty acids in the fat. And Beyond protein and fats uh, and, and chitin, as I mentioned, um, some other micronutrients are of interest in the black soldier fly larvae, such as calcium, which is at higher level usually than in fish meal, for example. Phosphorus, potassium, manganese are also minerals of, of uh, importance in the black soldier fly larvae product. Okay. So um, if we look at the main, I would say, market segmentation of potential applications in the animal feed sector and also the pet food sector, um, I mean, looking at the possibilities, it's actually possible to include insect products in all of them. Now, while nutritionally it can match or it can be used as a source of energy or source of nutrients by these animals, there is not always uh, an equivalent relevance in terms of economy compared to nutrition, nutrition uh, relevance. So today, uh, if we look at the most uh, use cases or the main use cases uh, in the context of aquaculture, which is a very important market in Southeast Asia, um, black soldier fly larvae products are a major macronutrient source. They can also be used as additive. Uh, with poultry and swine, um, the main use is as functional additive with uh, functional properties we will be uh, hearing about a bit later on today. And uh, with pet food, it is a, a source of value-added uh, macronutrients. 
Okay, so looking at uh, chitin, I'm giving here some examples of uh, relevant functionalities the elements of the black soldier fly, fly larvae can have, sorry. Um, chitin is recognized to have uh, antimicrobial properties when used in animal feed. It may also stimulate the innate immune system of the animals and can support the beneficial microbes development. So in, in a way, it works as a prebiotic in, in the diet. Um, the protein has interesting peptides. Um, there are uh, 50 antimicrobial peptides encoded in the black soldier fly genome. Um, these are also of relevance regarding antimicrobial properties, and it has also a reported bactericid effect uh, when used in animal feed. Lauric acid, major fatty acid in the black soldier fly uh, fat, has again antimicrobial properties reported, and it doesn't lead to any cross resistance uh, in uh, the animals that I use afterwards or for the consumers of the animal products that are fed with black soldier fly larvae before. And another point of importance is actually on animal welfare. Um, for example, with laying hens, the inclusion of a whole black soldier fly larvae has been reported to lead to a reduced uh, feather pecking between the laying hens, and as such, uh, reduce the damage between the animals uh, when they are provided with uh, live larvae as, as a supplemented element in the feed. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give back the microphone to Josh and you will hear in the next presentation some uh, more insights on the nutritional and health benefits of BSF for animals. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so interesting to, to hear about all of the different benefits from Black Soldier Fly. Um, so we've seen that, that the value chain is very safe and adheres to the highest standards of production. We've seen the, some of the benefits in terms of the nutritional aspects, but let's go deeper. In our next two presentations, we're going to look at, at the practical uses for black soldier fly that many of you will probably be interested in. So our next presentation is on livestock and BSFL. I'd like to invite to the screen, Rafael Hermes, Nutrition Director from Nutrition Technologies, to explain a little bit about land-based livestock and how BSFL can be beneficial. Thank you very much, Josh, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me for this webinar. I'm also a veterinarian. For me, it's a big pleasure to present to you some of the experience I'm having here in Malaysia by the use of producing black soldier fly and the application of this product into the livestock. So today I will focus on, on the livestock. So Raphael, sorry to interrupt. Can can you increase your volume just a little bit, please? It's very difficult to hear. Um, let's see. Can you hear me better now? Uh, it's still pretty low. Yes, let me see if I can have a better connection. Let's see. Is it okay? Let me see. Let me see. All right. I hope you can you can hear me better. Um, yeah, right. it's a little bit low. Some of the audience is saying that they're they're having trouble hearing. Oh, really? Give me a minute to. Okay. Let me let me come back here again. Uh, I'll try to to speak closer to the microphone. I hope okay, can. that's that's a little bit better. Yeah, we can hear or, you better now. Okay, thank great. you. All right. So um, to start, I would like to quickly talk about the how how big is the animal feed market, right? So seventy percent of the uh, of the market is uh, is the poultry and swine, and, but the aqua and pet. Are, are smaller, but they are more, uh, the feed is more expensive. So today, as Nathan told you, we can better sell and can better apply the black soldier fly because of the cost to the pet and in aqua industry. But the interest uh, is growing a lot in poultry and swine, and that's what I focus my presentation. First of all, let's talk about the regulatory uh, map 
were uh, fo pretty focused on the poultry and swine, you can see by the traffic lights that there is uh, uh, the use of, of uh, these products is not uh, prohibited for, for swine and, and, and poultry, but in some countries it's under discussion, intensive discussion as in US and in, in Europe Union. This year, uh, EFSA is under intensive discussion with the European uh, Commission uh, based in Belgium, where they are discussing by the extension of the use for poultry and swine more extensively. In Asia Pacific area is considered a animal der derived products and is, is, uh, can be uh, used uh, without any prohibition. Well, um, this paper was published a couple of months ago and give us an interesting data about the use of black soldier fly in feed, right? So um, uh, Tomberly and Van House, they, uh, they tracking down about these uh, publications. And as you can see here, only in the 70s was uh, at the beginning, the, the black soldier fly was considered as a pest and only in the 70s, that was the first reports of the beneficial use of this insect meal to uh, poultry and, and, and swine feed by the, a group of uh, uh, University of Georgia in USA, and they, they published that in the Journal of Animal Science. Um, these uh, researchers also, they published an interesting data about the number of publications, right? And from the 1947 to 2017, only 137 papers were, were published. So in 70 years, 137 papers. In 2018, only 2018, 185. 2019, 191. And in 2020, 289. So this graph uh, can uh, nicely illustrate the interest in how, how this black soldier fly industry is new and how uh, there is lots of room to, to understand uh, um, lots of topics uh, regarding the, the uh, the, re the rearing, genetics, nutrition, and I will talk a little bit more about in my presentation. Um, this is a list of recent and relevant publications, all papers published in the last three years. Uh, you can see multiple benefits uh, in the immune system, performance, uh, improved well-being. You can also start reporting by the management of chicken manure. You can all see uh, these benefits in the different inclusion levels. Uh, if you click on, on the reference in the presentation, you can uh, go directly and download the, the, the papers that were recently published. Talking about, uh, it's good that Nathan introduced this topic, uh, talking genetically about uh, the, the nutrients, but now talking more specifically for poultry and swine, uh, it's important uh, if you take a look on the black soldier fly meal, is a, is a protein ingredient. And the three main uh, topics for to cover and for a nutritionist to formulate diets with black soldier fly is the crude protein, lysine, methionine, and threonine. Uh, you can see that uh, the crude protein is only uh, is smaller than fish meal, but fish meal is very expensive. So it's pretty uh, competitive with the soybean meal, meat and bone meal, and, and is much higher levels of protein than, for example, palm corn meal. Uh, for lysine is, is one of the best uh, uh, contents of, of lysine compared to the other sources of proteins, methionine also, and threonine. And I also I try to here to, uh, to hypothesize like a diet with a pure black soldier fly. And you can see that if you had a, a pure diet with a, a black soldier fly, we would cover the protein, lysine, and methionine and threonine for for all uh, piglets, broilers, and laying hens, right? So it can easy, you can also easily see that it's a very attractive in ingredient that can be used for this species. Well, uh, let me talk more about this paper that was published this year by a group of researchers in, in Netherlands. Um, Nathan introduced this topic also that they reported, they basically test two different diets, one commercial one, uh, with the core soybean meal, wheat, and gluten meal, and they compare with a soy-free diet without any soybean, right? But for this group B, they uh, use this type of, of, of dispenser where at uh, 11.30 in the morning to 
5.30 in the afternoon. So six hours was dispensed. 275 grams of live black soldier flies to this, uh, through this funnel, right? So uh, with that, uh, during six hours, every laying hands were receiving uh, on average 12 grams of live larvae. And let's see the results of this publication. Uh, we could not see a difference on the performance of, laying, of this laying, old laying hands, but we can see that the feed intake was reduced by, on, only, the, only the feed was reduced uh, by this group, group B. And, uh, and if, uh, as we did not observe any difference in the performance, the feed conversion ratio was significantly also reduced by the use of these live uh, larvae, right? Um, what the researchers also investigated was uh, the behavior of uh, these laying hands. So they, they video monitor at the beginning, at the end of the trial, and they compare the group B larvae, which is represented by the blue lines, and the, the yellow lines are, are the, the group, the control group. And at 11 in the morning, all the, the, the big, the vast majority of, of the, the laying hands were on the floor, which means they were waiting for, for the live larvae. They were more, let's say, uh, entertained and they were waiting for this uh, special meal. So uh, impacted directly on their well being. And this is represented by the feather pecking score, uh, where at the beginning of the trial, uh, with 60, uh, uh, 67 weeks old was uh, a tendency to be higher. Uh, a higher feather pecking score means that uh, uh, the, the lean hands were, were more areas with the, with the damage, right? They were pecking each other. Uh, and at the end of the trial at 78 weeks old, uh, these lean hands were reduced significantly, uh, the, the score, which means they were uh, much better and they were, uh, we can consider that this. Uh, uh, group of, of laying hens that was receiving live larvae, they were less stressed and, more, and with a better well-being. Uh, in this trial that was published last year by a group of uh, Italian researchers from University of Turin, uh, they investigated the inclusion of uh, black soldier fly in piglets diets. They used uh, 5 and 10 percent inclusion, which means 30 percent replacement of soybean meal and 10 and 60% of replacement of soybean meal in the 10% treatment. So they, they tested three different levels. And what they observed, there was no significant gain uh, on the weight of the piglets, but uh, they observed a significant improvement on the feed intake. So uh, this means that uh, uh, this uh, diet of, uh, by using increasing doses of black soda fly were more palatable and uh, increase the attention, increase the, the, the feed intake of, of the piglets. Uh, if you take a look, these uh, papers, they also interestingly, they put a, a digestibility marker to see how, how digestible were the diets. And uh, interestingly, they did not observe any difference of uh, digestibility index for dry matter, crude protein, and fat by uh, increasing levels of uh, of black soldier fly. So, which means uh, the uh, inclusion of five or 10% of black soldier fly was as digestible as the soybean meal, which is a, a very nice result that can also uh, highlight it and, and help to, um, to uh, support the, the, the use of black soldier fly also in piglets diets. Uh, for the, the successful of black soldier fly future, uh, we would like to highlight that it needs to, to cover the, uh, a better bioconversion uh, for producing this uh, type of products. We need to, uh, to understand and, and, and it's possible to use different raw materials that other industries cannot use. Uh, it needs also to cover the mass production with that. Uh, is, is the right time where, where this industry is, is, is about. So now we are, we are ramping up the production uh, by, by having a mass production, we can also reduce the, the costs. And with that, having a more affordable product to, to reach poultry and swine diets, which competes directly to soybean meal. Uh, the genetics, there is also a big room for improvement 
by uh, that can lead to a higher life performance, for example. Uh, the nutrition, obviously, there is lots of, uh, of uh, room to, to understand the nutritional requirements of these uh, insects, larvae, and with that can allow us to be more precise, even design even better diets with a better performance for the larvae, and with that also producing a, a better quality products. And by the end, the health is, is also something that needs to be better to understand the knowledge is uh, as we are intensified this industry, as it happened with, uh, for example, shrimp industry or other industry that intensify the production, maybe uh, in the future can come some disease and we needed to, to have a better knowledge on this and also to, to know how to treat that when they appear. And with that, I would like to thank you for the invitation again. And if you have any questions, you can, you can ask me in the QA chat. And I'll come thank back you, to you, Joshua. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank um, you. There are some questions and we will get to those in the Q&A. Um, it's so Sorry. interesting to see the what's already available in terms of being able to replace unsustainable soy meal, but then also the potential for, for greater study and research and development uh, with black soldier fly for poultry and, and swine. So um, very cool on that. And another unsustainable feed source uh, is fish meal for aquaculture. Aquaculture is growing very rapidly. Um, and if you're familiar with the industry, uh, you know that it takes a lot of fish meal to feed uh, the aquaculture farms as fast as they're growing and the oceans are already overfished. So how can insects play a role in terms of being a sustainable feed source for aquaculture. And here to present on BSFL for aquaculture is Emily Divick, the R&D and Biology Director for Intofood, an AFIA member company in Malaysia. Emily. Thank you, Josh, for the introduction and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good morning for those who are following us from, from Europe. Um, I will now try to share my screen with you. Here we are. All right, so let's dive uh, directly into uh, our topic uh, today. Um, I will be talking about functional and nutritional benefits of uh, black soldier fly applied to aquaculture. So over the last decades, there have been a large quantity of publication and R&D looking at the use of black soldier fly product for aquaculture, mostly uh, defatted and whole uh, fat meals. On this slide, I have tried to list most of the fish and crustacean species on which the black soldier fly meal have been tested. This is probably not a, a comprehensive list as it continues to grow, to, grow, uh, to, to expand uh, regularly. The studies include generally growth performance evaluation, digestibility and health assessment, and meat quality comparison. However, the generalization of the results from the literature is difficult, if not impossible. In fact, all these fish and crustaceans have, diet have, have dif different dietary requirements, um, which means that they are not able to tolerate the same inclusion of uh, insect meal in their diets. The nutritional requirements of these fish and crustaceans also vary with their stage of development which is not always the same from one study to another. Another point um, is the nutritional profile of the black soldier fly meal that is used uh, and tested uh, into these studies. Um, it's not always consistent. The variability of uh, nutritional profile of the black soldier meal from one study to another uh, is uh, as much as uh, Nathan mentioned earlier, uh, due to the feeding substrate uh, that is used to produce the black soldier fly, the stage of development and the processing methods that are used to process the larvae into a meal. But from a general point of view, black soldier fly meal is considered as a good source of protein for, for aquaculture. In most studies, it has been used to replace fish meal or soybean meal at different substitution rates. As also mentioned by Nathan earlier, the black soldier fly meal is often compared to these two conventional feedstuffs because they have the, a similar amino acid profile, as you can see on the graph on the right hand side. 
Overall, the studies report a success, successful inclusion of up to 40% black soldier fly in fish diets. Some of the limiting constraints, however, that are highlighted by most of the studies are the following. The chitin content. It may affect the nutrient digestibility, but it's a controversial point as we will see in the next slide. The improper balance of or lack of some amino acids, especially the methionine and the lysine for salmonids like rainbow trout and salmon, uh, can be anyway overcome by supplementation of synthetic uh, amino acids in the formulation. And the last point is the limiting content in omega-3 or 6 that could impact the sensory attributes of the fish products. There is a plethora of publication looking at the nutritional benefits of black soldier fly meal and other products, but I have pre preferred to focus this time uh, on studies that are more that are looking at more uh, at different functionalities beyond the simple protein concept. So, as you may know, the black soldier fly are often exposed to hostile environment as they commonly feed on decaying organic matter. Into this environment, they can be exposed to pathogens of all kinds. But the black soldier fly larvae is very robust, and to my knowledge, uh, no disease outbreak was yet reported in any commercial facilities worldwide. This is probably thanks to the various range of bioactive compounds such as enzyme, chitin, short chain fatty acid, and antimicrobial peptides that have been identified in the larvae. This innate toolbox with a broad spectrum of activities against pathogens such as bacteria, virus, parasites, contributes to the larvae's strong immunity and its, and its disease resistance. Several studies suggest that these bioactive compounds have various properties such as antioxidant, antimicrobial, immunostimulants, etc. And they can be assimilated by farmed animals through their diets. So let's review now together a few studies that have highlighted some functionalities of black soldier fly for fish and crustaceans. The most highlighted nutraceutical effect of black soldier fly meal for aquaculture species is the modulation of the gastrointestinal tract microbiota. The gut microbiota of fish and crustaceans is plastic and it's usually highly correlated with their diet. A rich and diversified microbiota influence various, various um, functions of the metabolism, like digestion, nutrition, immunity, or disease resistance. Several studies have found that the inclusion of black soldier fly meal um, could significantly enrich and diversify fish and crustacean gut microbiota. For example, I have put two illustrative studies here. Um, black soldier fly uh, supplemented diet have led to the enrichment of some beneficial bacteria communities in the gut of marron crayfish. This increased rich, richness and diversified microbiota of the crayfish have accelerated its growth and improved its immune system. In another study on your right, Black soldier fly fed rainbow trout have also showed a clear increase in the firmicut phylum. These uh, lactic acid producing bacteria have the potential to help the fish to fight or compete with pathogens by improving mucosal activity and producing antimicrobial bacteriocins. Other common cells bacteria with antiviral or anti anti antibacterial activities were also identified in this study. The authors of this publication suggest that the insect chitin was the preferential growth substrate for these lactic acid bacteria. In fact, chitin and chitosan from crustaceans have already proved to enrich and diversify fish, fish gut microbiota, acting as a prebiotic and contributing to, the, to a healthy gut. Although it has not uh, been demonstrated yet, insect chitin might have similar uh, functionalities and properties. 
In the illustrating uh, study here, dietary inclusion of black soldier fly larvae meal has clearly improved the immune response of yellow catfish. Increased lysosome and phagocytic activity were found in catfish fed diet containing up to 10% inclusion black soldier fly meal. Other studies have also highlighted the immunostimulant effect of black soldier fly meal for fish. In Atlantic salmon black soldier fly diet, in that, sorry, in Atlantic salmon fed black soldier fly diet, uh, the, uh, an increase of T cell activities was observed. In marron crayfish, in addition to the microbiota modulation uh, that was described earlier, scientists have also noted an increase of cytokine expression in the intestine. This immunity boost effect can also be associated to the presence of insect chitin into the diet. However, it is also suggested that the antimicrobial peptides present in the black soldier fly larvae could have enhanced the immunities of these species. Insects are primary source of antimicrobial peptide. And again, as, as mentioned by Nathan, more than 50 uh, active peptides have been identified in the black soldier fly larvae. Antimicrobial peptides are key components of the innate immune system of most animals. And they have a broad spectrum of activities against bacteria, fungi, some parasites, and viruses. Previous studies on carps uh, found that diet dietary uh, um, uh, antimicrobial peptides reduce triglycerides level in serum, enrich oxidation resistance, and improve immunity of the fish. An increased lysosome activity was also noted in crucian carp fed diet with enriched AMPs. This stimulated immune response of fish may have contributed to the host resistance against pathogen. In the last two studies that I've mentioned, AMT, AMPs, uh, antimicrobial peptides that were used, uh, were, not com were from an unknown source, not from insects. At last, I wanted to highlight uh, another functionality of black soldier fly meal, its palatability. For most species in aquaculture, the chemical attractability of artificial feed is essential. It allows location of the pellet and ingestion from, from the animals. This is particularly important for shrimps. Our colleagues from Antobel, a company producing black soldier fly in Vietnam, also a member of AFIA, have compared the attractability of four, attra four feed attractants. For the white leg shrimp, um, for the white leg shrimp, liptopa, lip, uh, vaname, sorry. Um, among these four attr feed attractants, uh, there was one full fat black soldier fly meal and one defatted black soldier fly meal. The result of this uh, study showed, showed clearly that a dietary inclusion of 1% defatted black soldier fly meal is sufficient and the most attractant compared to the other feed tested. Other unpublished work on tilapia fry underline the same functionality. As a conclusion, we can confidently say that black soldier fly is a suitable source of protein for aquaculture, and it's also a palatable feed ingredient. The specific role of chitin in fish diet is still controversial, and it's mostly related to its, to its level in inclusion. When it's included at low level, it might act as a prebiotic, an immunostimulant, and an anti-inflammatory molecule in fish. However, when it's included in higher dose, it might reduce fish growth and cause intestinal inflammation. Overall results from the literature suggest that black soldier fly chitin, antimicrobial peptides, and other bioactive compounds have beneficial effects on the fish and crustacean health. The potential benefits of black soldier fly short-chain fatty acid, like the lauric acid, was not yet investigated for fish and crustaceans. Lauric acid have, however, uh, a very well-known antimicrobial effect, in particular against gram-positive bacteria, 
and could contribute to the animal uh, disease resistance. Further research is definitely needed to measure the effect of extracted and purified black soldier fly bioactive molecules on aquaculture species health and to better elucidate the species specific response induced by the use of insect based diets for aquaculture. I thank you very much for your attention and I pass back the mic to Josh. Thank you, Emily. Uh, it's so interesting to see all of these details and I, I see a lot of the uh, webinar attendees asking some really interesting questions as well. Um, it seems like this is really resonating and there's, as I think Raphael mentioned in his presentation, there's been just an exponential growth in the, in the amount of research studies the last three or four years. Um, so I, I assume that that will continue and there's, there's a lot more to discover for both aquaculture and insects as feed for livestock as well. Um, as we get into our second hour, I'd like to encourage you to keep asking questions. There's, there's been a lot of really great questions. We will get to those at the end um, as we'll have a, a public Q&A for everyone and we'll try and cover every one of these questions. Um, some of the questions may be answered by the moderators. Um, it's just an easy, easy answer um, regarding sending the um, presentations or the video, et cetera. Um, but next up, we have our Fava invited speaker. Um, this is Professor Dr. Samchai Champong Hassan from the Faculty of Veterinary Sciences. And he's going to be giving us the veterinary perspective on insect based ingredients as animal feed. Uh, Dr. Uh, Samchai is from Chulalongkorn, uh, Chulalongkorn University and uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say from the veterinary perspective as far as using insects with animal feed. Dr. Somcha. Okay, thank, thank you, Josh. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me, Josh? Yes, loud and clear, okay. sounds good. Okay, uh, can you see the slide? Can see your slide, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, all the participants. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Fava for inviting me to join in this webinar. And it's my first time. And it's my pleasure too. Today, I'm going to present the topic in which now the scientists and the nutritionists all around the world are paying attention. Protein from insects. I will try to give you briefly the general information of insects, not emphasizing on individual insects, but generally for the insects that we have in this world. Normally, uh, the protein form that the people in the consume that is edible protein from livestock or fishery product. But by the way, when the demand of protein is increasing, especially in developing country, due to the better status of economy and also uh, the increasing of the population, the demand of meat is increasing. Yeah, this picture shows the global uh, meat production for human consumption each year. Uh, it, it, it covered about 3 million tons of meat in, in 2018. How about the fish production for human consumption? It's just about half of the meat production in 2013. To fulfill the demand of animal protein for human consumption, the enlargement of livestock and fishery farm are relatively established as a result of the number of animals required for feed increase to feed these animals. The million tons of compound feed are produced each year. The last number of plants, including wheat, corn, or rice product, and also it need protein source such as animal protein, for example, fish meal, or protein, plant protein, for example, the soybean meal. 
And the next figure show that the, the fish meal production estimately about five to six million ton uh, was produced this year. Uh, most of fish meal is produced from the not, uh, natural harvesting fish. And uh, it is calculated that uh, about to produce one kilogram of fish meal. Uh, oh, sorry, to produce 16, so, uh, 7 million tons of fish meal. And uh, sorry. Approximate about 16 to 70 kilo, 70 kilograms of fish meal is needed to blend to get one kilogram of fish, of fish meal. And it means that we have to use almost half of the protein source from fish in nature to produce fish meal for feed industry, which it is a lot of wastage. The next slide shows that uh, how much uh, fish meal was used since 1999. And, uh, you can see that uh, uh, on the average, that, that the amount of fish meal use is uh, reduced each year that uh, because of uh, the price of fish meal is increased and fish meal is replaced by the other source of fat protein, especially soybean meal. This figure show the amount of world soybean production and it, the soybean production is about over 300 million tons a year. And uh, the major source of soybean is from United States, Brazil, and Argentina. How many tons of feed is produced to feed the animal, which we use for protein diet? In 2018, it, is a more than, it was more than 1 billion metric ton of feed was produced to use a livestock feed. And mostly it was used for poultry. And uh, approximately 20% of total animal feed is used to poultry, followed by pigs, cattle, and about 4% for aquaculture. Soybean is used to produce land on uh, lesion mainly for poultry. In European Union, the use of our animal protein for poultry feed are ignored because of the hygiene and the health problems of human. The problem of some diseases such as mass cow disease or salmonosis are preventing animal protein, including fish meal, to use in poultry ration. However, when you could our soybean product used in the industry. It covers about 80% of world soybean production. To produce soybean for feed industry, which is increasing in demand each year, it needs a lot of resources. As I have discussed before, to produce one unit of compound feed, it needs ingredients that contain energy and protein. The requirement for plant protein stimulate the enlargement of property used to grow and harvest in developing countries such as Brazil and Argentina. The property used for producing plant protein induce deforestation, soil erosion, eutrophication, and loss of biodiversity. Also, other necessary resources, including fertilizer, pesticide, herbicide, are need to increase the production of raw material for feed industry. These chemical substances cause a lot of damage to the environment and uh, by producing the last amount of pollutants. Also water uh, resources, which is expect to be shorted due to the demand for human is increasing. It's also need in large amount to grow raw material. Total resources, which I have suggested in the seminar, has shown that if we still continue to grow up our feed industry in the same direction as in the past, the world in the future is not is no more easy. 
problems, and it is the big problem that now humans are facing is pollution, especially global warming. Livestock is calculated that it accounts for 77% of global farming land, but they produce any food only 18% for human consumption. And total of 37% of protein need for human. It was found that 10 to 12 percent of greenhouse gas emissions originated from agriculture. From this large amount, it accounts for 50 percent of global methane emissions and 60 percent of global nitrous oxide accumulation each year. One type of gas, which is one main effect of global warming, carbon dioxide. It is estimated that to get one ton of soybean, we will get the hazardous gas content carbon dioxide about 113 kilograms, calculating based on the world soybean production each year, we produce approximately 40 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. Come to some conclusion. The problems in which we, the feed industry is facing now is the increment of raw material need for protein source because the increasing of number of animal in livestock industry. And the second problem is the increasing price of protein source due to the demand is increasing and then the, and the competition among the feed producer. Thirdly, the, the awareness of global warming and environmental pollution. So the new technology by replacing the conventional source of protein is needed and maybe using of insect as a sort of protein can be a solution. One researcher has concluded the benefit of at shipping by using insect. Uh, because uh, there are so variety of insect type in this world, there are over seven, seven, uh, seven hundred and 50,000 species that has been identified in, in the world. And all of them have a short life cycle, which it means it is easily to repeat breeding again and again. Insects can live in anywhere in this world. Insects can live, can be alive in various types of habitats. That is why we can see insects all around the world, but mostly they prefer the warm climate. From two reason, reasons mentioned before, meaning it will be low cost to breed. It can be produced to receive the large population and biomass by using small amount of resources. And continue of the benefit. Breeding can be simple and controlled. In Thailand, if you want to start to raise insect farm, you just buy insect egg from the other farm or buying the mature insect, bring to your farm, providing suitable habitat and collect feeding, you can continue to produce insect in which no need to introduce the new insect egg or mature insect from outside anymore. In which, uh, if you have time, I will show you, uh, I will show you some uh, picture of, of this. Insect control, uh, contain good quality of protein in which I will show you later. And finally, the result from using insect protein is excellent. All of the study concerning using insect as a protein source, including the good FCR return. I think I, I will pass this uh, figure. The, just show you the comparison of the essential amino acid and mineral between some insect and meat and conventional meat that we consume. This one here, uh, is a uh, speaker is just show you the nutrient composition uh, comparing between the different insect and the conventional protein that we normally use in feed industry. Okay, so because uh, some speaker has, has shown it before. This is also the same thing, uh, that's so I will pass quickly. So it, it, it is found that. There are some variety of uh, insect as the insect uh, as a source of protein. Okay. 
which uh, starting from black soil fly, which uh, our friend has shown you a lot of data of, of black soil fly that uh, it is appropriate to use as a protein source of, of animal feed. Following with the lava of, of some uh, lava of yet, or yet, and yellow mealworm, silverworm, and grasshopper, following by the termites. Okay, so you can see that there's a lot of variety of insects that can be used as a protein source for the feed industry. Just uh, briefly, because uh, some sister had has shown already some data. Uh, this figure just show you the, the summary of code response of pig fed that is containing insect. It seems that uh, at each level and uh, insect can replace both soybean meal and some source of uh, protein such as diplasma without any de detrimental effect or without any bad effect on feed intake, average dedicate, and SCR. How about the insect protein in, in protein? Our speaker has also shown already, but I just give the brief conclusion that it was found that insect protein can be used to replace fish meal or soybean meal without any bad effect on uh, the performance of, of the, of the poultry. The level used to replace can be partly or totally replaced. This is uh, are some example of the result from the literature review that, and uh, the experiment showing that the, the replacement, of, replacement of fish meal and soybean meal with grasshopper cricket or black soil flyer, the same response was achieved. How about the ruminant, which I think uh, it is, uh, there are some interest to use it, but not much information is available. And but it can be concluded from the available data showing that it may be appropriate to use in ruminant diet. Insect protein contain high level of methionine and lysine, which are the first and second limiting amino acid for ruminant. And secondly, insect contain high level of fat, which is not suitable to feed ruminants because fat is toxic to bacteria in the lumen. The good side of using insect ruminants are insect has low degradability in lumen. That means insect is not easily, easily digested in the lumen. So insect will serve as a food protein source and absorb directly in post-GI tract. The other advantage of using protein ruminant is insect produce less ammonia, so sorry, less methane in the rumen as compared to soybean. This is a study in in vitro. Insect protein for aquaculture, I think uh, Emily has shown you a lot of data, but just the conclusion for, for this figure is insect protein can be used to totally replace fish meal or soybean meal in a proper feed without any effect on the quality of fish, fish meal. Come to the conclusion. Insect meal can be partly substituted for fish meal and plant-based component. Insect require less space and energy for cultivation compared to soy. So it means that less pollution received Insects have a broad range of substrate they can thrive on, such as food there. So it means that it's easily to produce. Insects can be cultivated all year round because, uh, as I, I, I told before, that it can survive in various types of habitat and various types of atmosphere, except 
just uh, the too cold weather. And the use of insect as a metal feed could lead to less dependence on imported material, especially in some part of the world, such as European Union. And finally, they produce less pollutant compared to the other source of proteins. The next topic that I am going to talk is another benefit of using insect. If you follow some paper concerning the health status of human being, you may, you may hear something about the drug resistance bacteria or drug resistance infection. How come of this problem? The problem is the misuse of antibiotic. Okay. And the misuse of antibiotic is by using the improper of the doses or the wrong treatment of antibiotic. So it means that use uh, antibiotic to treat the infection too long or the residue from the antibiotic that is used in the feed industry for feeding livestock or the abuse of antibiotic. So this misuse causes the drug resistant infection. In Thailand, average 80,000 cases of drug resistant infection uh, occur each year. And there is a report saying that every 60 minutes in Thailand, there are two people die from drug resistant infection. And this problem is not occur only in Thailand, but I think now it's occur all, all over the world for the drug resistant problem. To resolve this serious problem, the scientists are looking for any tool to solve. And they found that there are some natural, natural substances that may solve the problem. It is called antimicrobial peptide. Some people call antimicrobial peptide proteins. What is antimicrobial peptide? A antimicrobial peptide or AMP is natural peptide chain that can be found in various species of animals, both vertebrate and invertebrate. Also, also found in various species of plants, in bacteria, in fungi. In vertebrate group, most abundant of AMP is found in insect. Its action is first line defense against foreign organism, which attack animal cell. And over 5,000 type of AMP are identified. AMP from insect was first identified in 1980 from the pupa of giant seal moth. Since then, over 550 AMP were isolated. The General characteristic of AMP or antibacterial beta. They receive to heat and easily dissolve in water, which it means AMP is easily absorbed in the intestine. But it is unstable in GI tract because it is easily digested by protease. However, AMP is tolerant to bacterial enzyme, as AMP has lower lumen decadivity. After and after absorption to the circulation, AMP is easily excreted because of AMP has a short half-life period. The biological action of AMP on pathogenic organisms is widely spread over all types of organisms, including bacteria, fungi, virus, protozoa. And in some study, there is an incident that AMP has the activity to suppress the development of cancer. The other action of AMP from the scientists finding are it, it can maintain the gut homo homeostasis, which providing the healthy status to the host other other action also concerning the health status of animals. 
AMP improved the, the inflammatory response of animal host, in which information of this aspect will be shown in the coming slide. The other important mechanism of AMP, AMP when applied together with antibiotic, it was found that AMP is the value of action of antibiotic. The most important activity which convinced our scientists around the world paying attention on AMP is the activity against drug resistant bacteria. There are several studies in vitro indicating that the biological activity of AMP against drug resistant bacteria. For example, methylene resisting, resisting bacteria, uh, Staphylococcus aureus or RM, they call MRSA, which is, which is one of the clear problems found in duct resistant infection. Now the scientist is expecting to use AMP as alternative tool to fight against duct resistant problem. The study of using AMP in the industry has come to the conclusion that AMP can improve growth performance by promoting digestibility of nutrients and improving gut health. So gut ecology is not suitable for pathogenic bacteria. Resulting in altering the intestinal microorganism and the food mechanism, and the food microorganism is increased and also en enhancing of immune function in pigs and boiler is commonly found when AMP was fed. The next two slides we show the effect of adding AMP to the diet pair to swine and poultry. The slide show the improvement of swine performance when AMP was added in the diet. It was found that AMP, both natural or synthetic product, improved crop performance of swine. ABG was improved, including FCR. Also, the reduction of pathogenic bacteria such as E. coli and Clostridium was noticed. Cut from one quality was also improved as intestinal villi is more developed, and this incident will enhance the productivity. This slide shows the benefit of AMP in poultry diet. The similar result were observed. ADG and SCR was improved, including cut morphology. The reduction of pathogenic ingesta was also found in protein fed AMP supplemented diet. However, there are some science, scientists indicate that the problem of using PMP was found. There are some cases show the allergic election action or hemolysis after using AMP. Or some scientists mention the low availability of AMP, in which it may be caused by the instability of AMP to enzyme protease. Some scientists give the some precaution of long-term effect of using AMP. AMP may develop another drug-resistant problem. The new problem may be occur. This precaution is still questionable. On the other hand, some scientists mentioned about this expecting problem, the new drug-resistant. Drug resistant problem occur linked from using AMP is scarce to be happened due to two main reasons. The first reason is the action, one action of AMP is they modulate adaptive immunity. There is a research in green piglet. Supplementation of AMP increase the T cell, the first line and uh, defense mechanism of, of the body. AMP also increased immunoglobulin G, A, and immunoglobulin M. Secondly, AMP attacks bacteria by four activities. AMP inhibits the cell wall synthesis of cell wall, of, sorry, of bacteria, and increasing pore formation in bacterial membrane, which means the cell of Bacterial cell, it 
easily to destroy. And also AMP activate the cell wall autolysis enzyme. And finally, AMP inhibit the bacterial spore germination. So it means that bacteria cannot tolerate whenever environment change. But this method of using AMP is uh, the purifying set AMP is still difficult to produce economically. So it means that now to extract AMP it costs it costs it is costly. And the stability of in AMP in the GI attack is not consistent. And AMP can cause some side effects. For example, the allergen or hemolysis. And finally, the low bioavailability of AMP. So I can conclude that with the development of technology evolving the new knowledge, effective use of AMP has a good potential to improve efficiency of pig and boiler production. I would like to leave some question. Will we use the insect protein as one tool to retard the least, uh, drug resistant problem, both in human animal to animal feed, or, or by extracting the purified AMP from insect? I, I give this uh, question to the floor later. To develop the utilize of insect protein as an animal feed, it needs to be produced and processed in large amount. So they can specifically supply throughout the year. And as I have seen the slide from the, the our speaker that now they are producing commercially, but in fact, I have not known that uh, how much it costs, which I think it will be a good question to ask the, the speaker in the panel discussion. And the process should be ensured to facilitate the safe uh, quality of protein. And it also, the regulatory framework and legislation for using it as an animal feed must be developed. And more study on evaluation of insect meal and insect protein as livestock and aquaculture feed are required. Impact of feeding insect meal on product safety for human health point of view and study on the human acceptance need to be studied further. And I think Dr. I will- Dr. Somchai, yes? sorry to interrupt. We, okay. we have about three minutes left in, okay, in this okay. part I, before we I will pass the next one. Okay, just uh, something you. that I, I, I will leave it to the this discussion that it can develop the new emerging disease or not by long-term using of uh, insect protein. And we have to study further uh, concerning about the some toxin from insect. And the GMO that may be developed, I, I don't know, okay. And uh, it, it can develop the new drug resistant bacteria or not. So I will leave it to the panel discussion. I will just show you some insect that is an edible insect for Thai people and it's uh, insect, edible in insect for Thai people is just like the, the food street, the street food, okay? It's, you can see this uh, type of, of uh, shop in the, some public area and the cost of the, this insect is very expensive. It varies from uh, two, uh, three to five dollars per hundred grams, not per kilogram, per hundred grams. And I think this, uh, I think this is maybe the picture of the, the soldier fly, okay? And yeah, this, this picture shows the, some small holder farmer that try to let the so, black soldier fly in, in, in some part of Thailand. Thank you for your attention. Sorry if I used thank you so time. much, Dr. Okay. Dr. Somchai. No, thank you so much. This, the detail on that is incredible. And I know that a lot of people that are, are watching uh, are very interested to, to um, 
read through again um, and dive deeper into that information. So um, we will follow up. We, we see that there are a lot of questions. Um, and this is part of why we're having this, this type of webinar. Um, I will let Nathan speak to um, some of the questions as far as working together and collaborating in Asia between universities and, and associations, AFIA and FAVA um, and others. But um, first we wanna have a, a short panel discussion about pet food. Um, so I wanna invite our presenters here and we'll just dive right into it. Um, and any of you guys can go ahead and jump in if you wanna answer. Um, insects for pet food, this is sort of a, an overlooked uh, industry, but it has a lot of potential, um, and it is a big industry as well. Um, so we've been talking mo mostly about livestock, but what about pet food? Are there insect-based products available for pet dogs, cats, and other, other pets anywhere in the world? And it's specifically, what about Asia? Go ahead and just jump in if, if uh, you have the answer. Okay, I, I briefly start to answer this question. Um, I believe uh, back in 2018, there was a, a publication in Europe regarding the availability of pet food products uh, using uh, insect as ingredients, uh, both BSF and crickets actually, uh, for different uh, purposes. The hypoallergenicity, hypoallergenicity uh, effect was actually a particular point for this product. Um, for what I remember, the, the range of inclusion was from as, as, as low as two, three percent up to up to much higher, like 30, 40 percent. Um, in, in Southeast Asia, though, uh, there, there might be a, a bit less products available at the moment, but this is definitely a, an interesting application. So there are pet foods available then that are using insects uh, for dogs, for cats. What, what are they specifically marketed towards? So for what I am aware of, I believe, yes, the uh, sustainability of the ingredient is, is a point. Um, of course, the functionality of the ingredient and the health benefit it can provide to the animals is, is also a point. Uh, hypoallergenicity for dogs, uh, the lauric acid can have beneficial antimicrobial properties as we highlighted before with, with cats. Um, they are, I believe, uh, health effects that can be definitely linked to the effect we highlighted in the presentation today with, with, with animals that are used as, as food. Um, yeah, that, that would be the range of, of interest that I think I highlighted. And again, uh, I think the, the hypoallergenicity effect for in, 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 dog, in dog feed is, is a special point of interest with the use of insects as, as pets. Rafael, is that something that you can elaborate on? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to add that uh, we just got the news that Purina Nestlé in uh, Switzerland, they just launched a product containing black soldier fly and they were claiming exactly what Nathan just said. It's uh, allergenic and is a, a better, a more sustainable source of protein uh, that uh, the pet food industry can, can start using. There is also some reports that uh, can be uh, uh, a good palatant because this is a, a like a natural uh, type of, of uh, food for, for certain species of pets. Uh, pet food is not only cats and dogs, there is also other species that uh, is, is highly attracted by the smell and, and the characteristics of, uh, of this type of, of insects. So it can, can be marketed also as something that uh, call the attention and and improve the, the well-being of, of these species by, by, by certain smells that uh, they can, can identify as, as good, as attractive. So in many ways, many of the, the things that were touched on for livestock could also then apply to pets, to the pet food industry in terms of the feed conversion and, and the nutritional benefits along with the sustainability and um, the high standards in terms of production. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, for, for pet food is um, the difference, basic difference between uh, uh, the pet food and, 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 and the livestock is that the, the livestock always try to improve the, the, the feed conversion ratio, right? So always try to, to, uh, to improve the, the, uh, how, how uh, the animals can bioconvert. In the pet food, uh, uh, they, they need to control their weight. So sometimes it's, it's, it's the opposite. They try to, to have something that the dog or, or the pet can, can eat, but uh, at the same time, having the, the, 
the nutrients uh, requirement to do not exceed that and do not uh, cause a, a, a weight gain, right? So this is a, a bit different the, the purpose of formulating diets, but uh, all, all, all diets, they, they needed to be attracted by, by the animals. They, they need to eat that. So, sure. uh, and, and with that, I think the insects can, can play a, a differentiated role by, uh, by being, uh, having some, uh, some uh, smells that can attract the animals, yeah, these volatiles. That, that makes sense. So instead of Thoughts. fattening up your dog, you just want to make, make sure that it's getting healthy Thoughts. nutrition as, yeah. as opposed to. Yes, Dr. Can, Sometime, I, ask, can yeah, I ask some question? Can I yes. ask some question? Uh, I, I wonder that uh, because nobody, no speaker has told anything about the cost of the insect protein in terms of the, the price. And can you show, uh, can you give some figure that uh, showing that uh, how much it costs per kilogram of feed or how much uh, the the cost, it, the cost in terms of the percentage of the total cost of feed. Thank you. Sure. Do, do any of the speakers want to want to approach that? Nathan, is that something that you want to answer? Or? Leo would be the, the best one to answer that, maybe? OK, yeah, Leo, can, can you answer that? We have Leo. Um, in, in terms of, of the price, oh, is Leo are you there? Yes. So Go ahead. Um, I think in terms in, in terms of the pricing, um, it's a there there is not yet a market or commodity price that you'd really be able to um, you know query on the internet in, in the same way that you could for um, for fish meal or poultry meal. Um, so what what we're seeing is usually that the the pricing is pretty dependent on um, the supplier company and the um, the volume and the contractual uh, agreements made. So um, we 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 usually see of up to ten times multiples whether you're you're looking for 100 kilogram or whether you're looking for uh, three containers per month for the next three years. Um, and um, those are those are really the um, uh, the, the key driver that. Uh, completely um, uh, determine the range of pricing that you'd be looking at. Um, you can you can find online uh, people selling um, you know insect protein like black soldier fly protein meal for um, in, in 500 gram bags uh, for something like 10 or 20 US dollar per kilogram, um, and um, you can certainly uh, also get. Um, prices that are much closer um, to uh, commercial fish meal um, pricing that you would get. But similarly, in, in fish meal pricing, if you're trying to buy 10 kilograms of uh, Peruvian fish meal, you won't get it at uh, $1.30 um, per kilogram. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's really the same for insects, but overall, the pricing is still at a premium um, compared to other animal, other mainstream animal proteins, right? There, there's a lot of uh, niche animal proteins. I mean, we talk about reindeer protein, we're talking about rabbit protein, duck protein, whatever there is in, in, in the animal protein space, those, yeah. those tend to be more expensive yeah. than yeah. insect protein today. Yeah, I, I ask this question uh, because uh, as I showed in the picture, uh, yeah, the, 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 the insect that the Thai people eat, uh, it costs about uh, I think almost uh, thirty dollars per kilo. That's a deep, deep fly insect. So it means that just uh, there are uh, only few people that can uh, reach this this type of, of protein. So that's why I, I, I ask this question. That, but I think uh, in the near future it may be when the technology uh, of the developing of a uh, breeding insect is uh, advanced. I think the price of of the insect may be reduced huh? in the near future, I hope. That is the thing about the industry that as it is growing and there's been exponentially more research the past few years, the price will come down as, as companies are better funded, better capitalized and, and able to do more research in terms of mass production um, to be able to compete with the much less sustainable 
uh, fish meal and soy meal. So um, that's a yeah, that's a great question. One more question for you, Dr. Sunchai. Does uh, Chulalongkorn University provide a service for testing insect ingredients for dogs and cats? It it depends on what you what do you want to analyze. <laughs> Normally, uh, uh, now we can uh, analyze only uh, what they call it the proximate analysis of the ingredient, such as uh, protein, fat, uh, some mineral, uh, for example, calcium and phosphorus mainly, and uh, some uh, protein, fat, or uh, and and fiber, and. Uh, Later on, uh, from now, we can uh, we have uh, some equipment to analyze uh, the cross energy. So that that what we can analyze now. So if someone someone is interested, they can contact you directly. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, because I'm still working in, in a department that uh, has done this uh, prop this job in the faculty. All right, great. So we have just a ton of questions um, and just a few minutes to go through these. So uh, we'll try and try and hit a, uh, a few of the, the key questions um, with our presenters. And then uh, we may need to follow up with uh, some of the answers to these questions um, via email. And some of them are, are specific to certain presenters and certain uh, themes. Um, one, one question that is, is quite pertinent to the collaboration here between all of the players that are putting this webinar together. Um, Nathan, maybe you can speak to this question there, there from uh, a viewer. Does AFI undertake to match make uh, technicians of BSFL uh, with businesses to start different operations? Um, and in conjunction with that, how can um, viewers, companies, researchers, uh, collaborate with Afia, with Fava, um, and with others that are, are part of uh, this webinar. Um, so definitely, it's great to connect to Afia to be part of a platform between researchers, businesses, and experts in the fields to uh, build momentum and answer uh, challenges that some of our members and some stakeholders may have with insects, food, and feed. Um, so, I mean, as an association, we have regular exchanges, we have a discussion platform, we share materials, we jointly uh, organize or co-organize events. Um, those kind of tools are building up the, the platform where we definitely invite uh, technicians and experts in the fields to connect with us, uh, where you can definitely link with businesses that are looking for uh, technicians or that are willing to, to build new uh, projects or businesses. Another couple of questions that were similar uh, is related to other insects. So um, I think Dr. Somchai sort of covered it in one slide as far as the, the many different types of insects that are out there. But there's also a few questions about crickets uh, as crickets are a very popular protein source, mostly on the human consumption side. Uh, they have been for the last few years. Um, but what is the difference? Why is the focus on the feed side for aquaculture, for livestock, for pet feed? Why is that mostly on BSFL and how can uh, crickets play a role or do they play a role for livestock, for aquaculture, for pet food? Um, and is there a way that the insects can, can be combined together? Are there benefits of BSF and crickets that can be combined to take the best of both worlds? Um, any, any of the presenters like to address crickets and BSF or crickets versus BSF? Well, I don't want to monopolize, but I can I can say a few words on, on that point. Um, there are several aspects that have maybe led to the differentiation of insect as feed and the main use of BSF and insect as food and the main use of crickets. Um, looking at the production, for example, um, with, with the black soldier fly larvae, we are talking about the larvae that, that enjoys to be in huge densities and uh, grows at large scale in, in a relatively easy way. While with crickets, with uh, their different legs and wings. This is something much more complicated to produce at very large scale, uh, for example. Um, but uh, even though we have made this differentiation of insect as food and feed, and even though it's part of our name, um, we, we, we can differenti differentiate sorry, 
more the applications than the species and the more it goes and the more this differentiation uh, or the, the less it applies i will say as, as leo highlighted there are already applications of bsf in insect as food uh, crickets can have relevant functionalities with insect as feed as well uh, and I would conclude with the point that uh, there are over 2,000 insect species reported edible. Each of them has different characteristics, different nutritional values. Um, so uh, yeah, they can have also different applications. And we are uh, we have still a long way to understand and and and, and manage all these potential uh, opportunities. All right, another question. Um... What is the most important nutrient in the feed for BSF? I'm not sure if this was covered, if anyone wants to uh, touch on this. In terms of um, what the BSF larvae themselves need to eat, uh, I think it was mentioned in a couple places that the, what they are fed, the substrates that they are fed, sort of changes their makeup in terms of the fat content, the protein content, et cetera. Um, but are there some general things for someone that's that's getting into this that that people can say okay these are the top three substrates that bsf should be fed on or can be fed on which are clean agro waste pre-consumer waste etc if i tell that my boss will fire me by the end of this <laughs> year so that is that's proprietary then that's something that companies are are doing research and putting money into figuring out so that they can have a competitive advantage yeah, exactly. It can be one of the, the, the trade secrets, right? How to better utilize the, the, the substrates we have. But what I can say is that um, it's important for, for a group of veterinarians that, that are here that we, we are, not, are not allowed and should avoid to use post-consumption food waste, right? So uh, we, we still don't know uh, what the disease this uh, species can spread and we needed to follow the European regulations. This is animal farming. So it's not allowed to raise a chicken uh, with the post-consumption food waste. So it's the same, same here. This industry needs to follow strictly regulations and taking care uh, because it can damage and can be very risky for us, right? So we are in a value chain that will produce uh, at the end of, of, of this chain, uh, basically uh, protein for humans. Uh, and we should avoid uh, the use of, of this post-consumption food waste as, as a substrate. It, it will be good. It will be great because it's, it's, it's a, with a lot of nutrients. But uh, uh, what the, the this industry is based is, is more on the on the. Uh, in, there is a lot of waste, industrial waste from from different industries such as bakery, the brewery industry, uh, the, the dairy industry. That lots of, of raw materials are, are throw it away. And we can use it and no need uh, specifically to use this food waste because of the risk of uh, spreading disease that we still don't know we still need to be, be investigated this is a new industry right so we, we should avoid to use that uh, as we are inserted in the in the in the protein uh, for for human consumption correct well, thank you to all of our speakers. We've come to the end of our time. Um, there's, I know there's a lot of more questions that, that people had asked and we can follow up on email with some of those um, that are specific. Um, but I wanna thank everyone who joined us uh, for this webinar. Thank you to the presenters. Uh, thank you um, to our organizers. And uh, want to just conclude by telling you about a couple of events that are happening uh, next year. Um, the VNU uh, Asia Pacific event and then ILDEX Vietnam. Uh, that event is going to be taking place. Uh, ILDEX Vietnam is the 21st to 23rd of July. Um, and that's next year, 2021. And that's going to be taking place in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Um, it's the eighth international livestock, dairy, meat processing, and aquaculture uh, exposition. Uh, for details, you can go to ildex-vietnam.com. Uh, another event that will be taking place is the 21st uh, Fava Congress, which will be in Kuching, Malaysia. That'll be later in the year in October, 14th to 16th of October in 2021. Uh, and for more information on that, you can go to fava2020.com. Uh, there's also going to be a webinar or potentially a webinar series uh, put on by AFIA and 
uh, Kassatsar University, which may take place in uh, May or June of next year. And we'll have, we'll be covering a lot more of these topics in depth again, um, over a, either a variety of days or a variety of webinar series. Um, I wanna thank everyone so much for, for attending, being part of it.